Hey guys, it's Poppin' Jock Slay here, back with another video. And today we're gonna do something a little different, something really special. I have to address a couple things and I don't usually do videos like this, but quite often people leave things down in the comments and those things are just absolutely not true. And if you keep leaving those comments over and over and over, people that see those comments, they're gonna start to think that those things are true. As a part of the culture, I feel like it's almost my job to make sure that you guys know the truth. So what I decided to do was to take 10 things that people often leave in the comments based on the brand and let you decide whether they're true or false. And then at the end of the video, I will tell you whether they are true are false. I'm gonna give you a number, I'm gonna give you a myth, and you have to decide whether it's true or false. You understand? I hope so. Hopefully that was cleared up. If not, uh, this is gonna be a really weird video for the watch. Either way, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, let's go. Number one, the Nike Air Force One is the first Nike sneaker with air. Now, for most of you, I'm going to guess that you already know that this is true or false, but I'll give you some background. So first, Nike did it in VidAir. It was actually created by NASA. The original name of the process was known as blown rubber molding, and it was used in producing helmets for NASA missions. That process was then updated, and a former NASA engineer named Frank Rudy pitched a similar idea to Nike for shock absorbers and running shoes. The idea was for a pad made of interconnected air cells that would be placed under the heel and forefoot to cushion the blow. Now, Phil Knight liked the idea so much that he made a prototype and he actually took them out running as a proof of concept for the idea. He obviously liked it and started putting it in shoes. The first shoe to retail with the new technology was the Nike Air Force One. In fact, that is how the name came about. Many people think it is because of the presidential plane, but really it is because of the first or number one of the shoes Nike made that features air. So. True or false? Is the Nike Air Force One the first Nike sneaker with air? Number two, the Jordan 1 was banned by the NBA. We've all heard the story of the Air Jordan 1 being banned by the NBA and how it turned the Air Jordan 1 into one of the most beloved sneakers we've ever seen. From skaters to artists to, to ball players, the Air Jordan 1 was a phenomenon and many people actually attribute it to the popularity of sneakers to say. Um, it was designed by Peter Moore. It, was, it didn't feature the Jumpman logo that we all know and love, but instead featured the Jordan Wings logo that we see on the Air Jordan 2 as well. And speaking of the Air Jordan 2, can we all agree that that shoe is underrated? I don't know why that shoe gets so much hate from the masses. Anyway, the Air Jordan 1 is easily the hottest shoe out right now, especially with all of the collabs that we see happening over the last few years. But all of this may just be because we like the shoe, not because it was banned. When the NBA wrote the letter about the shoes Jordan was wearing, he wasn't actually wearing the Air Jordan 1. He was wearing the Nike Air ships. But according to the commercial, that isn't what happened. So everyone out there with a pair of quote unquote banned Air Jordan 1s, you actually may be helping Nike tell a story that never actually happened. On the bright side, we all really love the Air Jordan 1 and it may have been all worth it. So, true or false, did the Jordan 1 get banned by the NBA? Okay, number three, Adidas stands for all day I dream about sneakers. Unique, right? Uh, so by now you've heard of the creator of Adidas, Adi or Adolf Dossler. He was a German cobbler, an inventor, an entrepreneur who founded the German sportswear company that we all love and rock to this day. The company was actually founded in 1947, I believe it was, under the name Ad Das without the I, but Adolf, being a master of marketing, wanted to change it and make it simple so that people remember the name of the company. And that is where he came up with the name Adidas and the moniker of All Day I Dream About Sneakers. He actually worked with an agency in Berlin that helped the De Beers company, you know, the diamond company that came up with the Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend slogan, and that is where the moniker came from. During that time, the term sneakers wasn't as popular as it is now though. In fact, people called tennis shoes tennis shoes because most people that wore those types of shoes used them to play tennis or to run track. Fun fact, Adolph actually gave Jesse Owens a pair of the track shoes for the original company he worked with before the Olympics in 1936 and he ended up winning two gold medals. They weren't technically Adidas shoes back then, but Adolf was a big part of him getting the shoes. Eventually, Adolf started his own company and later invented the three-stripe logo that we all see today. So, true or false, Adidas stands for all day I dream about sneakers. Number four, Vans is owned by Vanity Fair. You may not know it by the content on this channel, but one of my favorite brands is 
actually vans. One of my favorite models is actually the old school and the skate high, though I've been paying a lot more attention to one of their new silhouettes, the Ultra Range. It has a bunch of different models, but they're super comfortable, easily one of the most comfortable shoes you'll probably ever wear. I'll be honest, honest, I have a bit of pride in Vans because they started in and are still located in California, which is very rare when it comes to sneaker brands. The company was actually started in 1966 after the brothers saved Randy's Shoes, a company that I don't think is actually in business anymore. I looked them up. Uh, the original name of Vans was the Van Doren Rubber Company, and instead of going through a retail store to sell shoes, they instead sold them directly to the public. The company grew, and in 1988, the company was sold to a banking firm for $74.4 million, and they eventually merged with Vanity Fair in 2004. Fun fact, the company was popular in the mid-60s and 70s, but it was really popped off when the checkerboard pair showed up in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High on the feet of Sean Penn. Rumor has it that Sean Penn actually found the shoes himself, and the studio liked them so much that they actually put them on the cover art of the soundtrack. So, back to the question, true or false? Vans is owned by Vanity Fair. Number five, Nike Air is toxic. Now, when I say toxic, I literally mean toxic. Not in the way we think about future kind of toxic, but actually bad for the environment kind of toxic. So Nike Air was introduced back in the 70s and it's been a part of Nike cushioning technology ever since. For a very long time, Nike hid the air unit in the midsole of the shoes so you couldn't see it, but that changed back in 87 due to a young designer named Tinker Hatfield. Yes, the same guy that helped jumpstart the Jordan legacy when he added his designs and abilities to the Air Jordan 3 and added the Jumpman logo. When he was designing the Air Max 1, he was inspired by the center Pompidou during a visit to Paris, and it had this like open structure that he translated to the visible air unit on the 1. Little did we know, the consumer, that the air unit was actually made up of a toxic gas that contributed to global warming. Originally, the gases were hexafluorine, fluorine 116, and sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, but Nike eventually switched to just SF6 in 1989. In 2006, they phased it out and started using nitrogen, which is actually the most common gas in our atmosphere, and the consumer was none the wiser. So, true or false, was Nike Air toxic? Okay, number six, Reebok is a British word that means dance. <laughs> it started by doing a British accent, but after quickly trying it off camera, I figure it's best if I did it. Uh, now, this one has less to do with actual sneakers and more about words used to describe sneakers. So if you have any friends that live in the UK, you may have often heard them refer to sneakers as trainers. From an Adidas Ultra Boost to a Reebok Pump to a Dame 6, in the eyes of the British, they are all trainers. Same goes for Reebok. When the company was brought over to America from England by Paul Fireman, an outdoor salesman, he was told that the company was in fact based off the British word for dance. That helped lead to the way that Reebok shoes took over the aerobics market in the 80s and everyone that worked out had them on their feet. While there are a ton of people in the workout space these days, Reebok took the bull by the horns in the late 80s and absolutely owned the space. The company has obviously expanded beyond aerobics gear, but when it comes to working out, Reebok has a pretty big grip on the CrossFit space today. Crazy that all of these years later, they are still getting people to stay active, which I think is really dope. So. True or false, is Reebok a British word that means dance? Number seven, Reebok paid D Brown to do the no look dunk. Sneaker endorsements have been around for decades, but you don't often see them go down the way they did with D Brown in the slam dunk contest in 91. For you sneakerheads out there, I know mostly everything is about Nike and Adidas these days, but back then everyone had a piece of the pie. Nike, Reebok, Jordan, Adidas, K-Swiss, LA Gear, and a few others were all holding it down. You had a lot of different choices when it came to sneaker brands back then. D Brown, he was a Reebok athlete and the brand was super popular due to a Reebok sneaker called the Pump. It was originally made as a true tennis sneaker, but they created a basketball version as well and it took off. Part of that was because of D Brown. Prior to the dunk contest, Reebok put together a plan that D Brown would pump up his shoes before his final dunk to help make people believe that the shoes were helping the 6-1 guard win the competition when he did his famous no look dunk. As planned, D Brown did it and ended up going on to defeat legend Sean Kemp with his no look dunk. It was all just a big marketing stunt. After winning the contest, Reebok actually gave D Brown his own version of the Reebok pump basketball shoe and sneaker history would literally never be the same. So true or false, did Reebok pay D Brown to do the no look dunk? All right, number eight, Steph Curry left Nike because they called him the wrong name and reused the PowerPoint they used for Kevin Durant. We all know that Steph Curry's sneakers are made by Under Armour, but there was a time in the not too distant past when his sneakers were made by Nike. 
Not that he had a signature shoe deal with Nike like he currently has with Under Armour, but he was signed to the brand. Back a few years ago, Steph and his father had a meeting with Nike when it was time to renegotiate his contract. Steph was already doing some incredible things on the court and had basically his stock was rising as a star. However, at the meeting with the Nike team, they made a few mistakes that made Steph and his team rethink signing with the brand and pushed them to look at a few other options. First, when going through the deck to show Steph what Nike could offer him, the deck still had Kevin Durant's name in it, according to Steph's dad. Not only that, Curry's full name is Stefan, but the person holding the meeting from Nike called him Stefan in the meeting. Considering Steph is in the NBA and his star was rising and the fact that it seemed like whoever was running the meeting didn't really care enough to actually proofread the PowerPoint or get his name right, he made the decision to go to UA. Since then, Steph has become one of the biggest stars in the NBA and he has changed the idea of how to play basketball and stacked some NBA championships on top of that. The folks at Nike have to be kicking themselves in the butt for this one. So, is it true or false? Did Steph Curry leave Nike because they called him the wrong name and reused the PowerPoint they used for Kevin Durant? Number nine, Puma had ETPU, AKA Energy or Boost before Adidas. If you are a super sneakerhead like me, you know that ETPU stands for Expanded Thermoplastic Polyurethane, obviously. Uh, it is essentially a newer form of TPU, which we see a lot of brands use as cushioning for sneakers. Back in 2009 though, Puma said it started working on a dampening material, which promises higher energy return for runners with German chemical specialist BASF. The partnership between the two never panned out, but BASF later linked with Adidas in 2011, resulting in the launch of Boost in 2013. Boost is what is known as ETPU. Puma then started working with another chemical company here in the US called Huntsman Corp and launched their own version of ETPU called Energy. Since the introduction of the new technology, both Adidas and Puma have been in court trying to prevent each other from selling the product or claiming the other side had the idea first. Both brands have used the technology in their sneakers to varying degrees of success, but anyone that has worn Boost or Energy knows the technology and the feeling between the two cushioning setups is pretty similar. Boost is definitely more popular, but you can still buy the Puma Energy if you're looking for a different take on that style. So. Did Puma have ETPU, aka Energy, or Boost before Adidas? And number 10, Onutsuka Tiger created the Nike Cortez and Phil Knight stole the design. See, when Phil Knight first started out selling sneakers, it wasn't with Nike or Blue Ribbon Sports as it was called at the time. It was with a Japanese company called Onitsuka Tiger. As the exclusive distributor for the brand, Phil Knight and his partner, Bill Bowerman, helped the company grow here in the US. Because of the focus on running, Onitsuka Tiger wanted to make a running shoe for the upcoming Olympics. Originally, the new shoe they developed was going to be called the Aztec, but because Adidas already had a shoe with that name, they settled on the name the Cortez. Phil Knight and Bill sold so many of the shoes, they figured they could use it as a springboard to start their own company and took the design from Onitsuka Tiger to create their own version of the shoe under the Nike name. The two were successful in taking the shoe design and changing the brand to the Nike Cortez, and it became one of the shoes that launched the brand and helped them make a name for themselves in the running world. The Nike Cortez, or Tiger Cortez as it was originally called, has stayed largely the same since it was first introduced back in the early 70s and stands as a shoe that helped change history and separate Nike or really Blue Ribbon Sports from Onitsuka Tiger and changing sneaker history forever. So did Onitsuka Tiger create the Cortez and Phil Knight stole the design to create Nike? Okay, so now that you've heard the myths and you've heard the stories behind those myths, let me tell you the true or false. So number one is false. The first Nike sneaker with air is actually the Nike Tailwind. It was released in 1978. Funny thing is that if it was released today, it would actually be called the Nike Air Tailwind, but back then it was just the Nike Tailwind. Number two is false. The Nike Airship was the shoe that the NBA referred to in the letter they wrote. In fact, the NBA didn't even call it by a name. They just referred to it as the red and black Nike shoes. Number three, false. Adidas does not stand for all day I dream about sneakers. It's actually shorthand for the founder's name, Adi Dossler. Although he did originally call it Ad Doss without the I. Number four is actually true. Vans did merge with Vanity Fair in 2004 and now they're the parent company. Number five is also true. Uh, Nike Air was in fact toxic and considered a greenhouse gas. That is no longer the case as of 2006. Number six is 
False. It's false. Uh, Reebok is actually a version of the word Reebok, a word that describes a small South African antelope with a woolly brownish gray coat. And number seven, D Brown. That one is false. Reebok did not pay D Brown to do the no look dunk. According to D Brown, he decided to do it at the very last minute and pumped up his shoes as a way to get the crowd involved. In fact, he had already won the dunk contest. He didn't even need to do that last dunk. Number eight is true. In an article on ESPN, Steph's dad confirms the details of the meeting, including the fact that they said his name wrong and left Kevin Durant's name on the PowerPoint presentation. And number nine is true. Puma was actually working with BASF prior to the company ending their relationship and signing an exclusivity deal with Adidas two years later for a very similar technology. And number 10, Nike Cortez, Tiger Cortez, Phil Knight stole it. False. Phil Knight didn't steal the design from Onitsuka Tiger. In fact, Bill Bowerman, Phil's partner, designed the shoe in conjunction with Onitsuka Tiger. And when the companies parted ways, Phil and Bill brought the Nike Cortez with them as one of the first shoes they sold under the Nike brand. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this video. Let me know how you guys did. Uh, I know I would have missed a couple of these, uh, but I wanna know how you guys did. Let me know down in the comments down below. Also, let me know if there's any other myths in the secret world that you want me to debunk that either true or false down in the comments below as well. As always, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for watching. I'm Jock Slate, and I'll see you guys soon. Peace.